in proceedings. Uh, it's exactly three o'clock. We might have a few last minute stragglers coming in. Uh, we are indeed very fortunate to have amidst us uh, Dr. Uh, Dave Ramani with us today. He, uh, for some of you, needs no introduction, but I'll give a very brief summary of his many accomplishments. He's the founder chancellor of the Periyar Maniyammai University in Tanjavur in Tamil Nadu. He's also the founder president of several other uh, education institutions. He had his education at the Annamala University, uh, where he had an MA degree in economics with a gold medal. Uh, he was also conferred an honorary doctorate by the Alagapta University in Karaikudi. Uh, but more importantly for the purposes of today's talk, he is the president of the Dravidar Kazagam, founded by the great Periyar Ibrahim Swami himself. Uh, he's also a lawyer, editor of the Tamil Daily Vizuthalai, Punami, and as well as the modern rationalist English monthly. He's a prolific writer. He's written over 50 books in both English and Tamil, something that would put most Mike of us academics to shame. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, he was also uh, instrumental in bringing about the 76th Amendment to the in Indian Constitution, which inserted the uh, Tamil Nadu Backward Classes SCNSTs Act into the ninth schedule. Um, so I welcome uh, Dr. Vidamani. The subject of his talk today is the impact of Peria's visits to Southeast Asia. Lowers yours. Um, roughly talk for maybe 40 minutes or so, and then we'll have, since there's a and then big we'll audience, be a question then there'll be questions. Okay. President of this seminar and other professors and friends. At the outset, it is my proud privilege to thank you all for having provided an opportunity to speak about the impact of Periyar's visits to Malaya, Singapore, and Burma during the period 1929, where I was not even born, and 1954, as a student disciple of Korea, I had the privilege of hearing some of his speeches after he returned and made his impressions about his visit to Tamil Nadu. And this is one of an wonderful opportunity for the disciple of a Periyar. And that too, this is more relevant for a country. Singapore is a modern state which could be emulated in various ways by other states. And next year, this country very proudly is going to celebrate the 50th year, the Golden Jubilee. It is more relevant to think about Periyar's visit and what was the impact that it created in the minds of the people as well as out, outwardly also reshaped the lives of the Malaysians. There was only Malaya then, that was only a FMS then and now we are able to recollect what was the position that was prevalent when Periyar wanted to take a trip, make a trip to Malaya in 1929 along with his uh, first wife, Mrs. Nagamai and other disciples. And later on, in 1954, we could see. Before that, my speech will be about confining. Let us make first about, to this August audience, what is the mission and who is Periya? What was his role and how he shaped, how he was considered to be not only the modern uh, 
revolutionary, social revolutionary in India, but also his movement is a universal movement. It was not confined, it was not parochial, it was not sectarian. He was more concerned about humanism. Wherever the rights of humanism has been trampled or taken away, he is the first to give a call. And he won't even hesitate to enter into agitation and court even imprisonment. That was full of instances in his life. That is why in spite of his 75 years of public service, that 75, among the, in the 75 years of his public life, he received more brickbats than bouquets. He always swimmed, the, swimmed against the current. He was a very, he would like to be unpopular, not popular unlike others, because of the fact that he was for modern ideas, he was for rationalism, he stood against obscurantism. That is why he would like to be unpopular, because masses in any country, in any society, when somebody wants to be a champion of new ideas, to change the old order, naturally he will have to countenance the stiff opposition. He knows it, basically, because he didn't aspire for any power in his life. He wanted to transform the society. His methodology was to make people to think, think independently. He himself had a very formal education and that turned to be an advantage, not a disadvantage, so far as he is concerned. If he had formal education, he would have one of the class, one of the ordinary average person. He would not have been peria, what he was considered to be. He is an original thinker, bold enough to face any arts. In spite of the opposition, various kinds of abuses, humiliations, at long last, during the evening of his life, duly his service was recognized. For instance, many uploads were there. One, for the paucity of time, I would like to quote this. Inasco awarded the prophet of the new age, the citation goes as this. He was called the prophet of the new age. Very relevantly, it was very apt, the Socrates of Southeast Asia, father of social reform movement and arch enemy of ignorance and superstitions, meaningless customs and base manners. This UNESCO award was presented to Periyar at the age of 90 at Chennai. The award was presented by Dr. Tirigunasan, the then Union Education Minister, Government of India, under the presidentship of the Tamil Nadu Chief Minister, Dr. Kalanjar M. Karunanvi. The Government of India brought about a commemorative stamp in honor of his services posthumously during Periyar centenary celebrations, which continued for more than one year by the state of Tamil Nadu. When he died in 1973, December 4, 24th, he was given full state honors in spite of the fact that he did not adorn any gubernatorial state post because his great social revolutionary, this great social revolutionary was reigning without ruling. He never entered into the portals of politics after he quit <coughs> 1925, but he was able to shape the politics 
of not only Tamil Nadu but India. That was his great singular honor and achievement. The first amendment to the Constitution of India was brought due to his continued peaceful mass agitation. It is an order of wonders. Without having even a single member of the parliament for his side, he was able to carry out two-thirds of the majority to be passed and the first amendment to the constitution on the social justice question. If you are interested, you can go through his life. For want of time, I just I skip it over. He started his own weekly, yes, so a Tamil journal, social journal, Kudiyarasu, in 1925. This Kudiyarasu was in a very, uh, these are the volumes which we have documented afterwards because uh, those are all considered to be the very, uh, very great uh, thinking shop and uh, for all these researchers. That is why we are able to, this Kudiyarasu was a, a journal, a weekly journal which revolted the minds of the Tamil community and its wide circulation reached wherever the Tamils reside, including Malaya, Singapore, Sri Lanka, Burma, etc. At Singapore, the founder editor of Tamil Morasu, Mr. Tamilavel G. Sarangabani, you are all very popular and he is considered to be one of the pioneers for our Tamil renaissance and the rights of the Tamils as Godhead. <coughs> and he was the popular agent of Kudiyarasu who popularized that journal here and he became the disciple of Periya. At that time more than 4,000 copies at that time, that is unimaginable, that too in Tamil and uh, the three hours were denied to many people and you will be surprised to hear when one paper was sent to a particular person and like this, so many people in the estates, they will sit together, they will have a lantern by their side, one will uh, read it very loudly and others will have the hearsay as a hearing. So hearing that, that transformed their ideas, that transformed their lives, that is one of the wonderful achievements. At that time, more than 4,000 4, copies were sold in Singapore. He founded, when he quit the Congress, he founded the self-respect movement in the year 1929. The self-respect movement was a social movement. It was not for politics because uh, he was thoroughly disgusted and disappointed that politicians always care for themselves. And uh, the politicians, as he said very rightly, <coughs> thinks of the next election, whereas the social reformer thinks of the next generation. So Periyar was thinking about the next generations after generations to be reformed. That is why politics has no liking and he was not able to stick on for many time. The objects of this great self-respect movement, the very word self-respect itself he has chosen will definitely show how he cared for humanism. Because human beings, the separate and singular trait of the human beings is nothing but self-respect. So he has chosen, nowhere in the world a movement is named after self-respect movement. And Periyar was shrewd enough. Periyar was very particular. Periyar was so committed to the philosophy that dignity of the individual and independent thinking should always prevail in the society. The old order must change and yielding place to new. That was his idea. Like the objects of this great social movement, particularly when we explain about this moment, we will have to take you to India, Indian conditions. You are in a modern Singapore. Nowadays, when we explain about the caste, caste atrocities, all these things, except from people from India who have visited India, 
they won't be able to see what was the cause because today it is nothing. But we will have to go back to 1920s. We will have to go back to other centuries. What was the position then? That is why he wanted to change the society. The objects of this great social movement are to eradicate discrimination by birth due to Varna Shrama Dharma, which is an unparalleled cruelty prevailing only in Indian society. Nobody's status is decided by the birth. Everybody, man, human beings are discriminated by their birth. They should go according to Periyar, according to this movement. Next, when we want to do away with the discrimination by birth, he said not only it applies to caste, it equally applies to gender also. If women are born, then automatically they are considered to be inferior. You will be surprised if I am not deviating from this. Let me explain one thing. According to Manidharma Sastra, which was the basis for Hindu law, which is ruling even today in Indian courts, that the, the system of caste is not only inequality, Dr. Ambedkar, the father of architecture, Indian constitution, the great social revolutionary, very aptly recognized and uh, he defined the system of caste is not only inequality, but is graded inequality. That is, an upper man, a next one, the third one, a Brahmin is born on the head of the Brahma, and another person on the shoulder, another in the thighs, another in the lows, and they are called Shudras. And the Shudra means very demeaning term. And uh, these are the four groups according to Varna Dharma Dharma in the caste system. And uh, even below the fourth system, uh, fourth and fifth, they have created outcast. That outcast comes as untouchable caste. That is the fifth. They are called the Panchamas. And even among the lowest of the low placed women. That was the pitiable, very pathetic about uh, condition of the women. So Periyar wanted to eradicate this kind of superstition and the cruelty system. He considered caste as a cancer of the society. And women empowerment must be made. Half of the population should not be uh, denied their due rights. Spreading education to make people to be equality and equal opportunity. Another consequence of this caste system is the lower caste are not to be educated in spite of the fact that they have aspired for that, they have skill, they have merit, they have knowledge, everything. They are not allowed to go to schools. They are not allowed to go to have uh, education because education is the sole monopoly of the upper caste. And education was not at all socialized. This was the condition prevailing then. This was the situation. So Periyar's movement, social, this uh, movement was about spreading the education to make people to get equality and equal opportunity. And uh, to support this, religion was exploited. The name of God was uh, taken. The Puranas, the Idigasas, the, all the rituals, they were all just giving and they were all the instrumental for perpetuating the caste belief. Because when somebody says, look here, you and I cannot change the system. When somebody wanted so many people, even before Periyar, Sitters and so many people, uh, like uh, Ramalinga and others, they tried, but they couldn't succeed. Because of the fact, you say, you and I cannot change this, because this is God-made one. God has already ordered. You take Bhagavad Gita, where the Krishna has advised Chadurvarna Maya Srishta, it was I who created the forecast. Even the Dharma should be observed. Even if I, even if I myself volunteer, I cannot change the system. The constitutions could be changed, but not Gita. Words could be changed. This was how the minds were ingrained 
and people accepted. See, not only they were dubbed as low caste people, but the most pathetic condition of the Indian society is whether it is women, whether it is low caste people, they were made to accept and submit to themselves because they said, no, 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 it is your, your karma. It is your dharma. You cannot uh, change this one. This is how they were made to believe. So he wanted to promote rational and scientific temper about Periyar. Periyar considered the Indian caste system as silent and untouchability as a cancer society. You will be no. You won't imagine what is untouchability. Touching another person, one gets polluted. More than that, even before touching, unseeability was there. If somebody sees somebody, then he gets polluted. He was not allowed. He will have to go, rush back and take bath and everything. So, unseeability, unapproachability, these things, these were the horrors in society when Periyar started the self-respect movement. To him, nothing was more important than putting an end to these infectious, incurable diseases, even by a drastic surgery. Periyar remained a fighter all through his life, and his battles were on many fronts. Though his formal education was modest, he observed human behavior, how he himself has become a Periyar, the great person, how he was able to come to this conclusion, and launch a movement. What was his uh, capacity? Because he saw many things, even during his childhood, his atmosphere, how people were treated very badly, very cruelly. Then he himself uh, had an opportunity to think and come to a conclusion. So he observed the human behavior and sculptured himself. He sculptured himself as an original thinker, a pragmatic and rational humanist. His deep sense of empathy towards the depressed and the downtrodden and the disadvantaged, particularly the women, who constituted half of the population, that instigated him to fight for their improvement, empowerment as a priority. He had no particular emotional achievement. Attachment, he said in Tamil, I have no particular affinity towards anything. I believe in the Guru, I believe in knowledge, I believe in independent thinking. I don't attach much more importance to any other thing. If at all, if I condemn anything, because it abstracts my path. When I support something because it aids to large extent to come to that area. So he said he had no particular emotional attachment to any language or race, no faith in religion. He described his commitment is only towards the principles and not party. This is very important for any social revolutionary. He said in a, about himself, in Tamil, he used to tell, Nan Gurubodum Kachikaranaha Irindadile, Kulge Karnahata Nandarke. I was always a man of principles, not a man of party. My affiliation was not to this party or that party. Whichever party does the right thing, I will support. Whichever party goes the wrong way, I will condemn it thoroughly. This is his attitude. So, he endowed all his wealth to the public in total. Unheard of. In India, it is very rare. He was by rich merchant, he hails from a very rich family. And the people, initially, when he wanted to uh, organize the movement, amidst stiff opposition, when his disciples came, he spent from his own pocket. And you know, this journal, Kudiyaras, always he spent so many thousands losses. When somebody said, some people, they are returning the papers, how can, whether we are to continue this paper or whether we can stop this paper, because people are uh, not able to digest, because you are, as they are attacking scathingly, you are attacking their belief, 
because your battle is on the minds of the people. So can we stop some people around him, sir? He said, no. If even nobody reads it, I myself will write, I myself will print, I myself will read aloud on the payals of the house, and whether somebody hears it or not, I won't budge, I won't go back. This was his firm commitment, and he was very successful. He endowed all his wealth to the public, and he created a public charitable trust named the Periyar self respect Propaganda Institution, which is the registered charitable trust, which was recognized by the governments of India, the tax concession and everything. The trust and other sister trust, founded by his secretary wife, Mrs. E. V. R. Bani and Bain, runs many education institutions like schools, colleges, university, Periyar Maniyamai University and various hospitals. And before Periyar Maniyamai University was started, and uh, we have started uh, some 26 years back, an engineering college exclusively for women. Some of them have graduates here, and I am very happy there is a very, very good uh, uh, chapter here, uh, Periyar Maniyamai uh, University chapter is here for which our alumni is more than 100, in, uh, even in Singapore, throughout in America, in Canada, in other countries, these universities, alumni are there. More than 10,000 women graduates, they have all over the uh, uh, world, they have spread over. Because Periyar believed education should be an instrument of social change. Believed that education should spread and education should be socialized and it should be no more a monopoly of a few. It should be socialized and it only could make people to think. Next part of my visit, speech is about Periyar's visit to Malaya, Singapore and Burma. No, Periyar as I said, when we started to visit him, because people were very eager, through his journal, Kudiyarasu, he was able to create the impression, what is self-respect movement, and what are these principles. They were all very eager, and the laborers were there, mostly laborer people who were working in the rubber estates, and some of the petty business people, they were all here. But this, when they came here as an indentured laborer or the hired laborer those times in 1920s, uh, most of the people were uh, uh, employed as coolies, as, as uh, ordinary laborers in various uh, estates. There were no schools at that time. But this journal was more or less a teacher. And people slowly they were getting educated, so they were very eager to uh, meet Periyar. Periyar was also, because more than Tamil Nadu, the response for his ideas and journal was very good in so far as Malaya, Singapore and Burma, these countries are concerned. So when people some wanted this Saragavani in those times, when he requested him to visit uh, Malaya and Singapore, by that time Singapore is no, not a separate country. When he requested him, Periyar gladly accepted the invitation in 1929. When he came, there was also opposition like in Tamil Nadu. He comes there to speak about gods, religion, this and that. So he should not be allowed to enter here. But it was clarified. And he said in his mission, I am here only to condemn about your superstitious practice. I am not bothered about your God. I am not bothered about your religion, this and that. So his visit was mainly about uh, his reformation. He travelled along with his first wife, Evian Nagamai, and five others. Before that, I would like to give you a small picture. That was not, the caste and other things was not merely the Indian scene. 
the same people who came from India without leaving anything, they took all the superstitions, all the caste system with them and they were able to practice it here. The same discrimination here also. And uh, the superstition was so much. And let me, just by way of digression, let me tell one incident. When Periyar was addressing so many estates, laborers, in Tamil Nadu, they were all hearing it. He finished the meeting, and after the meeting was over, by, uh, by about uh, 8 o'clock, they were sitting for a dinner. One old lady, aged 40 years, along with his daughter, 20 years, she came along and asked, where is the Swamiya? Where is the Sanyasi from Tamil Nadu who has visited here? I wanted to seek his blessings. I wanted to see him. That is why I am coming from 10 miles away from the estate. And I am not able to hear his Uvadesa because already I was late. I would like to meet him and get his blessings. Then uh, somebody told me and people were laughing because his name was Swami, Rama Swami. And we used to call this uh, Tamil as Samiyas. And sannyasins we used to call it as Samiyas. So there is some Samiyar who has come from India. And uh, so he took she took uh, his daughter along with him and said, and prostrated. No, 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 Periyar never allows anybody to get prostrated before him. After all, man should not get prostrated. He is again self-respect and all these things. So what happened, you know? And uh, no, 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 uh, sir, I am unable to hear your Upadesa, but I request you to bless my daughter and seek some kind of good words and wishes because my daughter was married 20 years back, no child. So somebody was telling that you are a very powerful Swamiya, very powerful sannyasi. If you say something, my daughter will get a child. This is. Periya was laughing like anything. See, nothing to eat, it is all superstition. You go to a doctor and show it to your doctor your daughter, that will uh, uh, have some kind of effect. But uh, I cannot do anything, ma'am. Don't believe all these things. It is superstition. And I am unable to do that and you won't be satisfied if I say it. No, no, no. People were telling that all the big samyars, they will never acknowledge that they are great. But anyhow, if your words will definitely he said, he said. Then immediately, his wife, Nagamai, was sitting by his side. She, he asked her, you see here, he is my wife. We have no children for 35 years. <laughs> and you wanted me to bless me. That is, if I am capable of all these things, my, my wife would have begotten so many children. But my, myself, we are deprived of that. And I considered all the children, all the people in the world are my children. That is why I am able to do this kind of service. He was joking, no, 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 anyhow, unless and until you bless me, I won't leave this place. Then he put something and said, no, you will have your own children. Like that, that was the position. And even the practice of casteism was in uh, Malaya and the other places where the same discrimination people. For your information, that will be seen in this. The Hindu society, they organized the Hindu society. Even among the Hindu societies, there were so many divisions. You know, the castes, subdivisions, all these things. And uh, even in Hindu society, the Tamil Reform Society and the conference that Epo in 1929, when he presided over the past resolution, not only even to become a member of the Hindu society, the low caste people were not allowed. Only according to Varnashrama Dharma, the four castes were recognized. And the below the four castes, the fifth caste is Panchama. He was not allowed, even in Hindu society, at Malaya, to become a member. They cannot become. Even Marthwar community, the Barber community, they are called very Marthwar community, they were not allowed. Even the tappers, they were not allowed. Tappers, not our community. And uh, they were not allowed to become members, even though they, by religion they belong to Hindu religion. 
that was the situation and people were full of, uh, the estates were full of arak shops, liquor shops, people used to drink and they forget about that. So they extorted the money. So he clarified about his mission. It was not to demolish any temples or gods, only to destroy their superstitions and meaningless customs and abysmal ignorance of the Tamil community at Malay and Singapore. At very big conference he presided over Ipoh in 1929, and December 24th, he appealed to the reason to eradicate caste di uh, discrimination and abort the alcohol drinking habit and turn the new life a life of dignity and self-respect. In those days, Malaya was full of estates, as I said. It is the most surprising and shocking that Malayan Indian society never allowed the membership. But lower middle class people and some of them were motivated by the speech of Periyar to inspire confidence, courage and self-respect. They started the self-respect movement. Some of them rationalists, Buddhist professors like uh, uh, even at Burma, they were uh, writing about uh, the Periyar's birthday. Let me come now. We have already explained about what is Periyar's mission. And uh, he toured the entire Malaya from Penang, Kedah state and up to Muwar and uh, he came to Singapore then. He addressed meetings here. The same thing, wherever he went, he insisted about the social reform. Now, let us analyze about the impact of, uh, the, let us come to the direct link and come to the subject, the impact of Periyar's visit. This could be divided under four heads. One is social impact, another number two, economic impact, third, political impact, fourth, cultural impact. Social changes were visible through the awareness of not observing the caste and untouchability. Earlier, the caste, the firm grip, even, even now it was not completely, totally eradicated. Now we will have this barrier is more relevant even today at Malaya and because fortunately Singapore is very different picture. When I had been to Malaya, Malaysia recently, there, they want to revive the caste uh, associations because the one factor, the politicians are for World Bank. And this is a very convenient uh, facade for them to collect people so that they want to introduce what they have already forgotten and what we have taken the kajal and uh, destroyed it. But still, whenever a uh, uh, germ was destroyed, so we cannot close the hospitals, we cannot close the drug shops, and uh, always, that is the position, we will have to be eternal vigilance is the price for our freedom, that is more important. So what happened, you know, the social changes, they are moving freely now, and liberty of thinking, using reasoning power, and fully humanize the orthodox, interdining number of intercaste marriages, Self-respect and widow remarriages are performed at Malaysia and Singapore in many parts. Our Sarangamani has himself performed more than 500 to 900 marriages here. Periyar came and performed the marriages. You know here, the self-respect marriages is completely, this is in Tamil about the philosophy of the self-respect marriages. In our uh, country, in India, this self-respect form of marriage, which was devoid of uh, rituals, were once not recognized by the courts of the land. But without caring for that, people were uh, carrying on the very simple ceremony. It is like just the two will come and uh, perform the marriage by reading an agreement. And it is nothing but partners and equal partners, nothing but in a marriage is an agreement. Whenever you disagree, you are free to go away. This is how. But at the same time, both are having equal rights, equal opportunity. This was the main thing. And people 
in India as well as other people. They want to show the uh, vulgar show of wealth, pomp and all these things, marriages. Periyar's way of self-respect insisted, no more, only a garland, these two garlands are needed. Two witnesses are there and you need not spend much. Why should you invite very limited people for the wedding feast and everything? This is how you could register it. You can register it by the self-respect authority. And fortunately, this was recognized by the government of Malaysia subsequently because the impact of Periyar was that even the Dravada Karamites, the Periyar volunteers, which has more than 100 branches there in uh, Malaysia, they were appointed by the government of Malaysia as marriage officers. They themselves go to the self-respect marriage, they perform, they register it and keep a register which is a government document. Not even they can go to the registrar office and do that. The marriage officer will come wherever the marriage is performed. And here also, the Singapore also, there is a kind of uh, civil uh, rights marriage, all these things. For which Mr. Rajesh has very beautifully uh, documented that in his book here, uh, Indians in Singapore. How this was uh, done, all these things. This is a wonderful book. I am able to say, I am very thankful to Professor uh, who gave this morning. I was very fastly pursuing it. This is well documented about the impact, of what was the impact of Periyar, more than my speech. And the very corroborative evidence is being done from here. So I am too pleased about this. And the women empowerment, the girls as well as boys went to schools. And there was no school, but later on, even in Singapore, our Dr. Tinnapal in his uh, book was documented that when Periyar came here in 1929, there were no schools in the estates. But later on they started. He advised the rich community, the business community, instead of building temples, you temple, build a temple one or two, why you are going on building only temple? You start schools and thereby wipe illiteracy, create awareness. This is how that advice born and attached its own effect. And so many Tamil schools were there. In 1967, more than 30 schools in Singapore itself were there. Even some of the schools were named after Periyar, named after Arayadasa, named after other people, which we have documented there. Social justice combined with gender justice saw the light of the day. A silent revolution created in the minds to have a scientific temper. And uh, you will be surprised at Balaya conference. They were uh, passed. Don't uh, indulge in very despicable rituals by beating drums, this and then when a funeral is taken, all these things. Slowly they were giving it up. And more than that, the social impact was that all the children were able to get education and the various kinds of uh, a new uh, way of life, a very simple life, and he insisted you must save, you must lead a very thrifty life. Don't be uh, believe in a luxurious way of thinking. Whenever you earn money, you save, live a frugal or thrifty life. This is how he advised all Malayan and Singaporeans that had a good impact. And Periyar insisted to give education to their children and schools. And you know, we are surprised when this advice was tendered by him in 1929. When he returned in 1954 and addressed various places, he was thanked by the progeny of those people, those laborers, indentured laborers, which he addressed in various states. They become the graduates, they become the engineers, they become even the ministers in Malaysian government. They are able to, I could, if you want me, I could name few of them so that they adorn the post of the, because it was a great, it had its own impact. Periyar's visit converted them thing and insisted that education alone will be a deliverance to them. At Singapore, many elementary schools in the name of Periyar Nagamai, revolutionary poet, Bharari Dasan, 
were started and school enrollment was very encouraging and enabling use to a new world. Periyar's lectures made people to think and reverberate and realize truth and self-respect philosophy. The battle for change, this was not an easy thing. Immediately somebody, no, 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 even now what happened, whether people are all become rationalists, whether people are all become revolutionary. No, that is not the question because qualitative analysis must be adopted, not a quantitative analysis. When we analyze what was the impact, when society is changed, the picture was slowly and steadily because the indoctrination of the caste is 5,000 years old. You cannot, uh, by a miracle, you cannot solve it within 50 years or 60 years. That, was, that must be an answer. Periyar's lectures made people to think and reverberate and realize the truth and self-respect. The battle for change and aspire of self-respect was fought not on the streets, but in the minds of the people affected and aggrieved. There was a sea of change, more advancement of science and technology could not transform in the minds of the people from the superstition. Only persistent efforts to make them to think, reason and act independently would transform their lives. Periyar received proved this theory. Nowadays one may ask, no, 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 ever there, ever there is a scientific advancement is there, technology is there. Already we read, we study science, but all those who study science, are they become rationalists? Are they able to use their uh, thinking independently? Nowadays, there is another apprehension, another uh, problem is unscientific ideas are spread very scientifically through scientific means, that's all. In spite of the fact man lands on the Mars, but we, our people believe in survival ocean and so many ladies were unable to get married because of this superstition and it affects their lives. So merely by studying science, one will not get converted. Only through the panacea, only by Periyar's self-respect philosophy, by independent thinking, the critical thinking, scientific temper alone, one could get uh, to get into the modern stream of the advanced world. That was what Periyar was insisting. The lives of the Tamils were reshaped and their living, the alcohol habits and all these things were, as I said, the thrifty life was there. Everybody nowadays realizes and they're, they're must, they must save for their future. The education, they must get education, give education to the awards. And so everywhere this is the position. And the way it was so difficult was, why Periyar was attacking Many beliefs, some people say, why you should attack belief? Unless an attack, this belief, because basically most of the people, they were ingrained in the minds, fatalism. Nowhere the philosophy of fatalism was there. Fatalism is quite against the theory of motivation. Fatalism means it has written on the head. If you ask somebody, why you are not aspiring for them? No, 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 it is said written on the head. And Periyar jokingly asked the public meeting, who has written on your head? Let me point out. I will erase it. Come on, tell me. This is how we used to ask it. So this kind of fatalism, because of the karma theory, no, I cannot change this. Even in this life, I will have to tolerate. This kind of thinking was there for age old. And he wanted to change this one. His approach was very practical. Let us come to about this political impact. Socially, they were advanced, they changed. Economically, their lives were reshaped. Politically, what was the political impact is very important. You know, in those times, they were given, they were living for so many years. They earned so much, even the little business people, they don't want to invest in this country. They don't want to have a good house. They want to have settled in this year. They want to send every to India, everywhere to their relatives, and thereby when they go there, they see nothing there. 
and periyar when he visited here he gave a very very uh, individualistic advice please don't think of coming back to india settle yourself get your citizenship when the government itself when malayan government itself comes forward it wants to give more citizenship rights to all of you it is a very good opportunity you should not miss this opportunity catch hold of this opportunity snatch this opportunity and become that and this great disciple sarangabadi and this tamil reforms movement and they have started a tamil reform society in 1930s when he returned um, uh, 1932 they registered it in uh, sarangapatnam area and people we have given a very thing and he, he has given a very well documented thing and our uh, irshak is also uh, as recommended uh, uh, given it very nicely about the legacy the legacy of sarangapatnam he is i am very happy that he is here is a student compiler so this has percolated not only from professorial level in all level even among uh, youngsters even among students i am able we are very happy and congratulate periyar's work what was the impact of periyar this was uh, done very rightly and he said because of this uh, periyar's impact sarangamani and others went house to house campaign you should become uh the uh, real citizens then only you could participate in the democracy you could have your right and people were hesitant they were between the chilla and the cherry bits they were unable to decide but anyhow very are strong advice don't come back please sit here and care, take care of yourself and made long time back as a fatherly advice that made the present indians here so to lead a very modular life very modern life and very comfortable life which we are denied there in india so this political impact and the another thing is politically only in any country when when the pr won't help you and uh, you can play your part in the democracy also and you will vote and you will have your role as participative uh, role for uh, we now we are all having a we are having a participative democracy so we could decide so the younger generation should know what they are enjoying was the earlier the foundation was laid but due to the impact of periyar's visit like all these things so in this political impact periyar during second visit advised tamils very strongly not to think to return to india and try to get citizenship of singapore and malaysia they were registering for the citizenship who are permanent resident instead of pr you must get the citizenry right and join the national mainstream like many other these organizations tamil reform society volunteers went there and the malaysia the periyaris they went there door to door and they were able to get as many people as possible and they convinced them and they made them to register this kind of advice was very pragmatic and that stood him in good stead then last but not the cultural impact the culturally also when a nation is to be uh, as its whole the tamil community has to play its role culturally they want to preserve their culture language language said so many writers we are able to get because of periyar's views in olden days there were writers with orthodox view but modern writers like palavelu our dr tinappan has very professor has given a long list in this book singapore il tamil moli ilakiyam and the articles i was able to see which they have published in our society also uh, writers like mr palanivel poets like chinnappa chinnappan and mugilan and others and even our uh, poet here who is uh, very well uh, uh, recognized and awarded a great uh, recognition called the poet ibali is here and the government a few days back has given his honor 
all these things were the great impact of Periyar's visit. And the cultural impact is there. She is the fine fruit of this cultural impact. We are able to see him. And so many other people who are able to say, and they openly claim because of this renaissance in Tamil, that we are able to write this. And the poets, even there was another thing, uh, culturally, poets, writers, dramatists. There is one Mr. Varadam, you must be knowing it, because the local people must know it. When Periyar returned in 1954, they started a rationalist dramatic group. Mr. Varadam, he still is alive, Varadam. He is an old uh, senior citizen. And he was able to, they played rationalist dramas so that they were uh, caricaturing the superstitions. And more than lectures, dra dramatic effect will always convert them. So they were able to see all these things. So culturally also dramatic group. And more than what we said, it is better that I have already quoted a Professor Dr. Tenapan. And uh, you know the civil servant late lamented Mr. V. T. Arasu. And Arasu also, he has given a uh, very fine thing. Why I want to say is, it is not my fervent wish or because I happen to be the disciple of Periyar, I wanted to project Periyar as everything because of all these things. I want to cite from Singaporean statement. That is why I am going to conclude this. The VT Arasu, you know, most of them must be aware, he was a civil servant. He was uh, serving in the Ministry of Culture and uh, he was the editor of uh, Tamil Murasu and he has returned because of Periyar's visit. These kind of things have happened. And visually, a media car former editor, he has said, he has returned all these things. And more than that, here is a good documentation by Rajesh Rai, which for want of time I am not quoting, I am just introduction. So, my dear friends, I am very happy that you are able to hear and it is all my views. It is up to you to take it or discard it because I am a rationalist. Whatever right I have got, I am to say and you have got the right to whether to take it or discard. But I personally thank all of you for having provided this great opportunity because this audience is a wonderful audience in my life. This day I won't forget. And I am thankful. Once again, questions are welcome. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vinayabani, for that wonderful exposition, not merely of uh, Peria's impact in, on Southeast Asia and Singapore in particular, but also the principles that guided him. Uh, the floor is now open for questions. And could you just introduce yourself before you ask, ask the question? Questions right now. Let me. Why, why don't I set the ball rolling? <laughs> um, I just wanted to, you know, get back to your, uh, you know, the point that you were making about Peria not being a politician. Yeah. And I just sort of want to you know, get back to, you know, to, to uh, sort of Tamil Nadu politics in a way. And could you, you know, sort of throw some light on, you know, what sort of led to the you know, divergence between uh, Peria and and, and Nadurai? And, uh, Actually. Uh, late lamented Anna was an ardent disciple and uh, he has got very good uh, uh, understanding and he was the only provocator of uh, Periyar's principles to the core to all his youths. But throughout when after Periyar uh, quit politics due to our difference of opinion with Mahatma Gandhi on the social justice question, he once and for all determined not to enter politics because he very clearly explained this is a social movement, social reform movement, revolutionary movement. If I want to go to politics, I will have to 
care for the votes of the people. The votes of the gullible people. So I cannot maintain my independence of thinking. And I am to lead the people, not to be led by the people. And if I want to become a politician, I will have to be led by the people. Kariya never believed in populism. As I said earlier, he, was, he aspired to be unpopular. But at a point of time, Anna and some of his friends, they were under the impression that they could do more in politics. They aspired for politics. So they want to enter politics. Periyar never allowed them to go to politics. They know very well. And uh, even when his uh, chief ministership was offered, when Rajagopal Achari resigned in 1938 by the governor, governor general, Periyar flatly refused in spite of the insistence. And uh, he was the uh, leader of the Justice Party. But he didn't. So, from the beginning, Periyar, Shandhi, Periyar don't want to go back. And uh, Anna wanted to go to politics. That made him. For that, he took the pretext of Periyar's marriage. Well, uh, my name is Iftakhar Chaudhary, uh, uh, Principal Fellow Institute. Uh, you, you have spoken of Periyar's economic, uh, economic, social, and political impact. But did he ever think in terms of, uh, of creating an impact himself on, on, on the religion itself and make his movement uh, uh, a, some kind of a Protestant movement, much as Martin Luther had re uh, sought and did reform Christianity? Could he conceive of Hinduism without the caste system? Uh, uh, you know, something that is uh, uh, something I can you uh, has been uh, quoted as a Socrates of this thing. And Socrates yeah, yeah, is the yeah, yeah. sort of the uh, counter counter pro proposal. But was there a counter religious uh, element in his thinking, a kind of Hinduism which was a new form of Hinduism, which is a Protestant movement? No. He is not believed in any religion. He believed in the way of self respect because if you considered and make it as a religion. Even, you know, Buddha was not, Buddhism is not a religion in the real sense of the word. And what Buddha wanted, Buddha was the greatest rationalist, started. But his disciples, they wanted to convert him as a religionist. And uh, because Periyar as a rationalist, he never believed him, he, he condemned religion because if you organize, whether it is unorganized religion or uh, organized religion, the religion, there must be ritual. And regarding God, one may say that there may be, even in Hindu, the godless persons are there, they were also considered to be the Charvagas, this and that, as uh, all these things that uh, but is But did, did he consider himself as a Hindu? No, he, he, he self-respecters, that's all, rationalist. And he never believed and he never supported any religion because of the fact that once you go to religion, you cannot question anything. You, religion means obey, believe. Religion, the basis of every religion itself, whichever religion, even if you call Martin Luther religion, he reformed to that extent. But you cannot have an independent thinking. Once you question, you, you lose your right to question. And you will have to believe. Believe me, otherwise you will be condemned to hell. You will be condemned to the, this one. So, Religion never allows, and religion is full of rituals. Religion needs an institution. Periyar never institutionalized his policies. And for your information, when Periyar was prized like anything during his birthday, people were uh, extolling his services because of you, this and that. Say, look here, today you may be pricing me. Some 200 years back, one person may say, no, no, there was one person called Ramasamy who was very reactionary, very backward. I give that right because his uh, knowledge would have been gone to such extent. So, Periyar never believed in religion. It is not to substitute one religion for that. And self-respect philosophy is not a substitute for any religion. It is for humanism. Yeah. Uh, 
another question. Uh, I think we can just take a couple of questions together uh, because we're running short of time. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, I'm Chitra Shankar. I'm from the English department at NUS. Um, I would like to ask a slightly provocative question, and that is uh, the way in which Dravidian ideology has changed and evolved to its current state. What do you think, how much of Periyar's true ideology do you think is reflected in today's Dravidian politics in the state of Tamil yeah. Nadu? Okay. This point is very, very important because there is always a confusion and those who want to discredit the real movement utilize it very conveniently due to some political defaulters. And when we want to christen it, when we want to question about Periyar's movement, Periyar movement is purely a social movement. When somebody deviates and starts a political party, it is not a party. That is why Periyar distinguished himself and his movement as not politician and not political party. And when somebody starts from, even if they happen to be the offshoots, as the carrying the name of the Dravidian, Dravidian Dravda Munneta Karagam, Anna Dravda Munneta Karagam and all these things, when they go there, actually that is a different entity. Even though the name may be there, but at the same time, the content entirely deviates from them. So you cannot find fault. So far as Periyar's uh, principles are concerned, it is spreading, it is taking its own route. But for it, I would not have been invited here to about to speak him. When Periyar came, he addressed only in the public meeting, in the hall. But Periyar, disciple, after so many years, after 80 years of his visit, he was given a patient hearing to an intellectual audience like this. So that means Periyar movement has succeeded. But kindly, I would warn the people concerned that Periyar movement is not, there is a, like uh, astrology, there is pseudo-astrology, that's pseudo-science. Astrology is not a, a, the difference between astronomy, astronomy is a science, and astrology is a pseudo-science, just like that. The care, very name came in, uh, uh, taking Periyar. So many people even put Periyar's name, Periyar's flag, Periyar's name. Periyar has become a very good uh, saleable commodity so far as the political parties are concerned. So we will have to be very cautioned about that. I am very thankful that so far as Periyar movement is concerned, it is not still, it is not <coughs> adulterated. Okay, we have a final set of questions uh, together. Uh, there's Sujinda and Surin. Hello, uh, I'm Sujin uh, from Institute of South Asian uh, Studies here. And um, I think you visited our department two years back uh, in NUS. And I, at the time, I raised the same question. But I would like to uh, ask the same question again, whether you have the answer now or not. Um, at that time, I uh, asked it to you um, about uh, the upsurge of Dalit par parties in Tamil Nadu, right? Um, you know, Peria was uh, fighting for um, Dalit's right in the early 19th and uh, 20th century, but ironically, this, uh, ironically these days, we uh, are observing a lot of Dalit parties, more parties upsurge, um, uh, you know, that are fighting for their uh, rights. And uh, how do you assess uh, these Dalit parties? I mean, do you think really uh, Peria's philosophy is working for their parties, or how do you see? What do you what do you what do you say? I can follow. So, no, for I example, think, uh, the uh, liberation contest, right? Better come closer. So I think what she's asking is in now that there is a multiplicity of Dalit parties ah. in Tamil Nadu. Ah. So she's asking about yeah. the impact and you know what sort of Peria's message. Uh, yeah. I think, but I mean, We'll just take another question, you can maybe answer both together. Okay. Yeah, so, because we're running out of time. Yeah, so in our line from this institute, I don't know how well you knew Periyar, but he was born in a rich Kannada family. How, how did he 
switch to Tamil and also what was the turning point in his life which made him become a rationalist or par excellence, you know, par excellence and also why did he dissociate himself with the Justice Party later on? Thank you. How to? How did he dissociate him? Why did he dissociate justice himself party. with the Justice Party? Yeah. yeah. Two separate questions. Actually, uh, the same point just uh, Dr. Chitra has uh, raised one. When Periyar was there in the uh, Justice Party, he was even uh, elected uh, leader. Uh, in spite of his uh, reluctance, he was elected as a leader in 1930s. When uh, Justice Party lost his power, uh, he was responsible for uh, re resurrecting it. But it was considered to be a party of uh, rich people. And most of the justice leaders, they were all elite group. And they never bothered about, they never, they were not to come to the down to earth. They were not concerned about the masses. And uh, they were accepting about the credentials from the government. Periyar, that is why in 1944, Periyar self-respect movement of 1926 and uh, the Justice Party, which was uh, started as a political party, as a non brahmin party in 19, uh, from 17 onwards, which was on the ruling party from 1920 to 26, all these things were there. And uh, Periyar, when he was elected as 1930s, uh, he uh, was uh, presided over uh, the other conferences as a uh, formal thing. In 1944, he has drafted a resolution which he named through his lieutenant Annadurai as the Annadurai resolution. There, he specifically said no distinction, no titles should be given by the British government should be accepted. And another thing, this we should not contest for the election. We should not aspire for political offices. We must give it up and we must care for more for a uh, common man and about their education, educational opportunities, about the social justice question, about the reservation for the jobs, for the students, all these things, this was concerned. And that is why he renamed it as Dravda Kadaham. Because the non brahmin they were calling it as non brahmin party. That was in a negative way. And he said, look here, Brahmins are 3%. When the non-Brahmins are 90%, why should the 90% people who are in the made in a very negative way? And they have got their own um, historical cultural identity that is Dravidians. That is why he named it as a Dravidian Dravda Karaham for which. Fortunately, I would like to uh, tell you an interesting thing is, when that resolution was passed in 1944, I was a young man of 11 years who participated in the conference. I had the privilege. I saw that resolution and conference. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think there's a other question. Yeah, question that the other question is about you know, the, the, the multiplication of uh, Some Dalits are Dalit people. parties. And yeah. I think the larger question Come on, come on. You, are they? you come. Come yes, closer. Sorry, Let me answer. No, she can hear you. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can. Yeah. Yeah. Because I could follow you. Yeah, so um, because so I want to follow your question. Okay, uh, my question is simple. I mean, we are observing the upsurge of Dalit parties these days. So if Korea was fighting for the rights of Dalit, then, you know. Uh, my, my. So why are there so many Dalits? Yeah, my question is why, you know, why so many Dalit parties are uh, provoked in they are fighting for, I mean, they, why they come uh, in front to, uh, you know, give their rights back and uh, what is the irony? I mean, I want to ask, uh, you know, the... Actually, uh, people, as I told you, they are enamored of politics. When they are enamored of politics to contest more elections to become ministers and this and that occupied. And they wanted to start a political party. And uh, like your country, in our country in India, there is no ceiling for starting any party. 
Even if there are two members are there, one can part. One cannot start a school easily. One cannot start a factory, but one can start a political party very easily. That is why <laughs> there so many Dalit parties are there. And uh, even for uh, the same ideology, they, they will profess the same ideology, but have so many 16 parties on the same. Because 16 leaders want to be there. So they want to be leaders, they want to occupy force, they want to adorn the post, they want to enjoy, they want to exploit the gullible masses. That is, to be very frank. I want to be brutally frank. Thank you, Dr. Vilamani. I think we have to end this very lively discussion here. There's a small session from Princess. Uh, yeah, we will Thank you. Thank you. I feel very happy.